throughout history, there have been those men who have stood for freedom and biblical morality. Today, as Americans move more and more away from God and morality, we have become enslaved by sin and an oppressive government. This program will cover such questions as, should we obey every law from government? What has happened to the church in America? Will we be judged if we allow our government to continue in its wicked ways? If we think that we can sin against God and get by with it, we're mistaken. And if we think that we can let our rulers commit all kinds of ungodly wicked acts and we escape, once again, we're mistaken because of the covenantal nature of government. God holds the people equally responsible as he does the rulers. Each one of us is responsible for the future and the hope of our children. America's problems cannot be ignored. If you care about this country, stay tuned. Find out how we can turn our country around. Author and historian, Pastor John Weaver, has studied these subjects for over 26 years. He travels across America, preaching and lecturing in churches, colleges, and conferences. John Weaver is an expositor of God's whole word. His preaching style is in the tradition of our early American pastors whose pulpits were the cradle of America's Christian liberty. There are a number of pastors in prison today. Now that blows the minds of the average American and Christian. Why? Uh, they automatically think that if a man is in prison that he's got to have done something wicked and wrong. And we've got to get that mentality away from us. The Apostle Paul was thrown in prison and he certainly had not done anything wicked and wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ himself was arrested in fact, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of me, his prisoner. In other words, don't be ashamed of those who are suffering for righteousness sake. You do not have to commit any crime in order to be thrown in prison today. When I say that, I mean a crime that is wicked and wrong and violative of the, of the law of God. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. Uh, there is a pastor right now in jail in the state of Mississippi, Pastor Herman Fountain. And basically, he's in jail for two reasons. Number one, he refused to take a license to run his church ministry. And they arrested him for violating the court order. In other words, here the state is saying, in order to do what God has told you to do, in order to have a certain church ministry, you must take our license. Now, by the way, let me just tell you, any legal dictionary will give you the definition of a license. And it is essentially this, permission from a competent authority to do something which otherwise would be unlawful to do. And so, if he had taken a license, he would have been admitting that it would be unlawful to obey God and to carry out the ministry that God had given him without having permission from the government or from the state. <laughs> Pastor Wayne Lowry in Kentucky has already been in prison and he's facing another uh, jail term. Why? Because they're passing a law that you have to take a state license, in essence, to preach. You have to pay a tax in order to preach the gospel in, the, in, in, in Kentucky. They're in Louisville. He says, I'm not going to take a license. I'm not going to pay a tax to do what God has already told me to do. I might point out that John Bunyan spent nearly 14 years in prison for this very thing. He refused to take a license. Dan Gibson is another man who is serving about three or four years in prison out in Leavenworth, Kansas. And his big crime was showing Christians who were protesting abortion how to protect their assets so their property would not be confiscated by the government. That was his big crime. And so he's now serving a prison sentence for that. 
You could go all across America and God's men are being thrown in prison just for simply no reason at all. They are not wicked men. They are not men who are going out committing common law crimes. There are men who just simply disagree either with public policy or with some positive law that has been put forth that is contrary to the Word of God and contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ. How did you become aware of civil government's authority? Well, a number of years ago, the state was attacking our church in several different ways. And there was an awful lot of pressure put upon our church. And the men came up to me one day and they said, Pastor, uh, can the government do these things that they're doing? Do they have the authority? Is it right? And what is to be our response? And so I told them, I said, well, to be honest with you, I don't really know, but I'll find out and let you know what the Word of God says. And so consequently, because of those questions and because of the pressure of persecution and harassment, then I began to study the Word of God to find out exactly what God did say about civil government. What is government's authority? I found out that God had ordained three basic institutions. He had ordained the family, to be a minister of education, the church to be a minister of grace, and the state to be a minister of justice. And as I began to study these three different institutions, I saw that God had given each one of them a certain sphere or area of authority. And then I began to notice the broad principle, the institution, and the nature of government. And I realized that uh, from the study of the Word of God, of course, that only God is sovereign. And since God is sovereign, God had said, all right, family, here is your sphere of authority. Church, here is your sphere of authority. And government, here is your sphere of authority. And so the sovereign God of the universe is the one who ordained government. He is the one that has said, this is what government can do and what it cannot do. He is the one that has set the limits. He is the one that has defined the boundaries. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 75, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is judge. He putteth up one and he taketh down another. So it's God then who has ordained government. And since God is the one who is ordaining government, God is the one that determines what government can do and what it cannot do, what it can be and what it cannot be. One of the most exciting times was when I really studied the terms in Romans chapter 13, when I found out what God said that he had actually ordained government to be. For instance, uh, in verse 1 and 2, government is called powers. Well, uh, the Greek word there is exousia, which literally means jurisdictions or authorities. Literally, he says, there is no authority or there is no jurisdiction but of God, the jurisdictions that are or ordained of God. When you come to verse 2, a government's not only called power, it's called the ordinance of God as well. So God, once again, is ordained and set up government. And then when you come to verse 3, government is called rulers. Well, everyone understands that word, uh, chief ones or leaders. But when you come to verse 4, God says, for he, that is the civil ruler, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword of God in vain. He is the minister of God to thee for good. Now, the interesting thing is twice in verse 4, government is called the minister of God. The Greek word is dekonos. Literally, it's where we get our English word deacon from. And the word dekonos literally means servant. That's what the word deacon means. So God has ordained government to be his servant his deacon. God set up government to serve him. Moreover, in verse 4, the Bible says that the civil magistrate is to be an avenger of God. And the interesting thing about the word avenger, it comes from the Greek word ek dikae, literally an exactor of righteousness or one who draws righteousness out of. So God tells us that government has been ordained not only to be a power, not only to be a ruler, but to be his servant and also to be his exactor of righteousness. And then when you skip down to verse 6, once again, government is called the minister of God. 
<laughs> the word minister there is different from the one in verse 4 in the Greek. It's the Greek word liturgos. It is where we get our English word liturgy. Now, liturgy is a word of the temple. It literally has to do with public worship. Literally, God is saying in verse 6 that government has been ordained and set up by God to be God's public worship. Now, there are many people who are willing to say that government is power, that government has to do with authority and jurisdiction, and that government has to do with rulership and leadership. And that's true. The Bible teaches that. But how many are willing to go as far as God does and say that God ordained government to be His servant, to be His exactor of righteousness, and to be His public worship? God is the one that says, I have set you up. Here is what you're to do, and here's what you cannot do. Your limits, your boundaries are determined by me. Government is is an institution that has been ordained by God and therefore it is answerable and it is accountable to God. And God will certainly judge anyone in government who does not live up to his commands and his demands. What has happened to the church in America today? One of the problems that we have in America today is this, that the church as a whole has left the Word of God. We have not only left the Word of God, we have left the Constitution. Unhappily, many people not only do not read the Word of God and have never read the Word of God all the way through even one time. And most people have never even read the Constitution of the United States. It is our covenant, it is our contract, it is our compact with the civil government. And most people have no idea what is contained either in the Word of God or in the Constitution. Now, I admit that the Word of God has far greater authority than does the Constitution in the United States. But the thing that I'm saying is both of those documents are extremely important to we Americans. Now, when I say that we've left the Word of God, we've either left it or we have decided that it is not applicable or we have decided that certain portions of it are for us and certain portions of it are not for us, and consequently it's the same thing as just simply denying that the Word of God is indeed the Word of God. But the problem is we do not know either the Word of God or our heritage. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, God said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In John 8 and verse 32, Jesus Christ said it like this. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, if you do not know the truth, then very obviously you're not free. And if you're not free, that means you're a servant or you're a slave. And it's high time we, not only as Americans, but as Christians, come back to the Word of God and we say this is what God says about the church, this is what God says about the family, this is what God says about government, and we bow to the sovereign authority of God in His Word. It's high time we come back to our government and say God demands that you submit and surrender to His Word. Moreover, we demand that you submit and surrender to the Constitution, that which you have agreed to abide by. Should we obey every law from government? Well, there are so many answers in the Word of God. Uh, the very first thing that you would need to do is understand that Romans chapter 13 does not teach unlimited submission to civil government. It does not and it cannot for several obvious reasons. The very first reason is it would certainly not be in agreement with the analogy of faith. For instance, one of the laws of hermeneutics is whatever your interpretation of a certain passage is, it cannot conflict with the general teaching of the Word of God. That is, your interpretation must conform with the general teaching of the Word of God. It must be brought into conformity to the analogy of faith. Now, there are so many instances in the Bible where individuals disobeyed civil government and they did so with the apparent blessings of God. For instance, and to me one of the simplest answers is this. So many people say, well, Romans 13 says obey the powers that be. 
Well, I like to ask people, who wrote the book of Romans? And the answer comes back, the Apostle Paul. And then I ask, well, who wrote the book of Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Philemon? And the answer comes back, the Apostle Paul. And then I ask, well, do you know uh, what that group of books is referred to as? And they think a moment and they say, yes, I think they're called prison epistles. And I ask, why are they called prison epistles? And they respond very obviously because Paul was in prison when he wrote them. And my next question is, well, why was Paul in prison? And the answer comes back, he was in prison because he was disobeying the powers that be. He was disagreeing with the civil government. And they are the ones that imprisoned him. Now, <clears throat> if Paul had meant obey every ordinance and obey every law of civil government, then Paul disobeyed his own precept. For he certainly did not obey every rule of civil government. That's why he was thrown into prison. Are there other examples in the Bible where people did not obey civil government? Daniel 6 tells you how Daniel disobeyed the written law of the land. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3, they not only disobeyed the law of the land, they disobeyed to the face of Nebuchadnezzar. He said, if you don't obey me, what God is he who will deliver you out of my hands? They said, be it known unto you, O king, our God can deliver us. Huh. But whether he delivers us or not, that's his business. But be it known unto you, we will not bow down. Blatant disobedience. And God spared them. God blessed them. When you come to the New Testament, hey, the apostle Peter and the other apostles said in Acts 5 and verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. And then finally in Acts chapter 5, there, there's an illustration where God himself moved to overthrow the edicts of the rulers. They had taken the apostles, had thrown them into prison, and had told them not to preach. But the Bible says by night, God sent an angel and unlocked the prison doors and said, go and preach to the people all the words of this life. So God let them out, and God said, you do exactly opposite of what your rulers are telling you to do. So it's very obvious then in Romans chapter 13 that the submission that is demanded is not an absolute and unconditional submission. It is rather a general submission. And I might add this. The general submission that is demanded of people in Romans 13 verses 1 and 2 is conditioned upon the rulers being what God has ordained them to be in verses 3 four, and six. They are to be God's rulers. They are to be God's ministers, God's deacons, God's servants, God's exactors of righteousness, and God's public worship. When the rulers are those things, then we have to submit because they would then, in that case, be the ordinance of God. What if our laws are contrary to God's law? Once again, we have to take the attitude that Peter did in Acts 5 and verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than man. You see, the submission that God demands in Romans chapter 13 is to lawful authority. God never demands that we submit to unlawful, usurped, tyrannical authority. The state has no business leaving the lawful area and sphere of authority that God has given to it. When it does, it has no binding influence. It has no binding power at all. The interesting thing is, the Constitution of the United States even says this as well. Did you know that the Constitution said that this Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof that is, in agreement with the Constitution. And all treaties which are made in agreement with the Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. And it says that all the judiciary shall be so bound. The Constitution or the laws of any state notwithstanding. In other words, no state, no group of people, no one has any right 
to pass a law, a statute, or an ordinance that conflicts with the Constitution of the United States, if they do, then that law is null and void, ab initio, from the beginning. It has no binding power, and the Constitution said the judiciary shall so declare it. So neither in the Word of God nor in the Constitution <clears throat> are the people bound to obey usurped tyrannical authority. Now, it is true. It is true that there is a lawful governmental authority. And we as Christians are not anarchists. We want to be submissive to a lawful, godly government. We're ready to. But God never requires us to submit to tyranny and to submit to a dictatorship. He never requires us to do that which is contrary to the Word of God or contrary to His law. Huh. God has given us government to be a blessing to us. In fact, the purpose of government is spelled out very plainly in Romans 13 verses 3 and 4 and 1 Peter 2 and verse 14. Government is for the punishment of evildoers and for the protection of the good doers. And so very obviously, God is not going to take that which he has ordained for our good and turn it around and let it be for our bad and an instrument of bondage and enslavement. So there is no submission owed to tyranny. Let me show you. I could not look at my wife and say, Sweetheart, we're short on money this month. I want you to take this pistol and go rob the bank so I can have enough money to pay my bills. Why could I not do that? You say, but, but Brother Weaver, the Bible says, wives, obey your husbands in everything. And the Bible does say that in Ephesians chapter 5. I could look at my wife and say, God says you've got to obey me in everything. Now take this pistol and go rob the bank. You know what she should say? She, she should say, Honey, I love you, and I want to be submissive to you, but God has never given you authority to violate his law. God has never given you authority to command me to go contrary to the word of God. I want to obey you, but in this instance, I have to obey God rather than man. I cannot rob that bank. Now, very obviously, my authority as a husband is limited. I do not have the authority to command her to go contrary to the Word of God. Likewise, the authority of the government is limited. It does not have the authority to ask us to do anything that's contrary to the Word of God or even contrary to the Constitution of the United States. When it leaves its sphere of lawful authority, it loses its authority. What will happen to America if we continue on the same course? To answer that, you've got to understand the covenantal nature of government. You see, in the Bible, government is covenantal in nature. In fact, 2 Kings chapter 11 and many other passages tells you that basically there are two types of covenants when, uh, in relationship to government. First of all, there was the covenant between God, the king, and the people. Now, in that covenant, the king or the civil ruler agreed to be God's ruler, and the people agreed to be God's people. And then the second covenant was between the king and the people. That is, he agreed to rule faithfully and lawfully, and they agreed to be obedient. Now, numerous times in the Bible, the Bible speaks about this covenantal relationship in, in civil government. Now, there are certain verses in the Bible you cannot even understand unless you comprehend this uh, covenantal nature of government. For instance, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 3, uh, Solomon said that uh, he exhorted us to keep the king's commandment, and that in relationship to the oath of God. What oath? Well, it was the oath taken at the covenant. In other words, we agree to obey as long as the governor rules faithfully and lawfully. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 13 that we are to be in submission to godly civil rulers, not only for wrath's sake, that is, because they have the power of the sword, 
but also secondly for conscience sake. Now the word conscience in the Greek is shunadesis. Shun is a preposition which means with, a dasis to know. When you come to the English word conscience, con is a preposition which means with, and science means to know. Your conscience is that which you know with. So God says we're to be in submission to a lawful, godly civil government because we know that we ought to be because it's the ordinance of God. Now, in understanding uh, the covenantal nature of government, you've got to remember this. First of all, in biblical covenants, when one party violates the covenant, then it looses the other party from obedience. Now, that's not only true in biblical covenants, that's true in our human covenant as well. For instance, I could take you in the Bible and show you that, as well as practical experience today. In Joshua chapter 2, the two spies entered into a covenant with Rahab. They, there were the parties of the covenant. Then there were the stipulations given to the covenant. They said, now look, here are the stipulations. If you want to be spared when we come back in and fight, you've got to hang this scarlet cord out of the window that you let us down by. Moreover, you have to have all of your family in your house because we don't know who belongs to you. Now, if any of your family comes out in the street and we kill them, well, that's too bad because they ought to be in the house. We don't know who is your family. But on the other hand, they said, if we come in this house and hurt anyone, then their blood is going to be on us. That is, we will have violated our end of the covenant. And so as they started to leave, they said, oh, there's one more stipulation. She said, what is it? They said, if you utter any of this our business, then we're quit of our oath. In other words, if you violate your end of the covenant, if you don't keep this secret, then we're not obligated to keep our end of the covenant. And she said, according to your word, so be it. Now, we have in our land today courts of equity. If you tell me that you're going to build me a garage for $10,000 and that garage is going to be a 20 by 40 and that you agree to build it out of cypress wood and that you agree to shingle it with uh, cedar shakes all for, for $10,000 and then you agree to wait until the job is complete for me to pay you and then when you get the job halfway finished, you come in and say, I want my money and I said, I'm not going to give it to you. And you say, why? I said, well, you're, you're violating the covenant. You're violating the contract. You say, well, I'll take you to the courts. I said, well, take me. And so the judge looks at me and says, Mr. Weaver, uh, did you not agree to give this man $10,000 for a garage? I said, yes. Well, he said, why don't you do it? And I said, because, Your Honor, here's the contract. He agreed to build me a 20 by 40. He's built me a 15 by 30. He agreed to use uh, cedar wood. He's used pine. He agreed to put cedar shakes on the house, and, and he's just put simple uh, tile up there. And moreover, he said that he would wait until the job was finished before I had to give him the money. Here it is in black and white. And the judge looks at me and then looks at you and says, case dismissed, you don't owe him a thing. He's violated his end of the covenant, and you don't have to give your end of the covenant obedience until he performs his end. Now, the same is true not only between man and man, it's true between God and man. The Bible in 2 Kings chapter 17 shows how God had entered into a covenant with Israel. But Israel disobeyed God. Israel rebelled against God. Did God keep his end of the covenant and uh, bless Israel? No. He judged her. He dispossessed her. He sent her away into captivity. All you have to do is read the, the book of Hosea, read the book of Amos chapter 4, read Isaiah 58. God did not keep his end of the covenant when Israel disobeyed him. Now, if this principle is true between man and man and between God and man, now man and man would be the least, God and man would be the greatest, it is also true in that which is in the middle, man and government. When government violates its end of the covenant, its end of the agreement, then we are not bound to obey. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but that is the exact same principle that our forefathers fought on. You see, George III was 
king of England, yes. But he was also king of Georgia and king of South Carolina and king of Virginia. He was king of all the 13 colonies. He had entered into a covenant. He had entered into a contract with our forefathers. The Fairfax Resolves are very important resolves. They were written by George Mason and George Washington. Here are 24 resolves where our forefathers in 1774 were pleading with George III to keep his end of the covenant. He did not, he would not. They said, though we are willing to be the subjects of your majesty, we're not willing to be his slaves. And if you continue to push us, we will use every means at our disposal to keep from becoming your slaves. He went on, uh, or they went on in uh, the 23rd Resolve. And they said how much they loved George III and how much they wanted to be dependent upon Great Britain. But they said, if you keep pushing us and if you try to make us your slaves, you need to consider there can be but one appeal. And of course, that one appeal is, we will fight. And since George III violated his end of the covenant, then the Americans, or the colonists at that time, did not owe him obedience, and they ceased giving him obedience. The Declaration of Independence sets forth that whenever a ruler becomes a despot, and whenever there is a series of events that are falling one upon the other, that have the evident design to subjugate or subdue the people, the Declaration says it is our right, it is our duty to overthrow such a government and to establish one which will be more uh, kindly and beneficently designed to protect us and to preserve our rights. And so that is basically the principle. But now there's another principle. You see, in biblical covenants, and listen to this, God holds both parties responsible. Now, let me throw something at you. When a ruler sins as an individual, God always judges that individual ruler. But when that ruler sins publicly and the people do not stop him, God always judges the people with their civil ruler. Will we be judged if we allow our government to continue in its wicked ways? If there was no other verse in the Bible, this one would be sufficient. Jeremiah 15 and verse 4. The Bible says that God scattered Israel because of the sins of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Why did God send the people into captivity for that which Manasseh did? Because Manasseh was their king. And he was wicked and vile, and everybody knew it, and no one lifted a finger to stop him. And so God judged the people with their ruler. The attitude of the average Christian and the average American is this. Well, it doesn't bother me what they do. Whatever they, and they is our civil rulers, whatever they do, they'll have to answer to God. I've got news for you. Not only will our civil rulers answer to God, but we will answer to God for allowing them to do what they're doing. It is our responsibility to stop them. We must call them into account. We must ask for a redress of grievances. We must dispossess them. We must recall them. We must do whatever we can to stop them from committing all their wicked and ungodly acts. If we don't, we'll be judged with them. You know, many people have the idea that, hey, judgment will never fall on America. God won't judge his people. Have you ever wondered how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Ezekiel got into Babylon? They got there as captives. When God was judging Israel, even godly Jeremiah wept as the city was destroyed and the best of the Israelites were carried away into captivity. If we think that we can sin against God and get by with it, we're mistaken. And if we think that we can let our rulers commit all kinds of ungodly, wicked acts 
and we escape, once again, we're mistaken because of the covenantal nature of government. God holds the people equally responsible as he does the rulers. Where have we gone wrong? I mean, why hasn't the church stood for what is right? Uh, the basic responses would have to be, we're never going to reclaim America until we reclaim our pastors. The pastors do not realize the authority that their office holds. There were men in the founding of America that were so hated by the British that they were the special objects of assassination. And those men were the preachers. The British referred to the preachers as the black robed regiment. All you have to do is read books like J.T. Headley books, Christian Ministers of the American Revolution. There's another book, The Spirit of 76, American Ministers in the War of Independence. You'll find men like James Caldwell. James Caldwell was pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Elizabethton, New Jersey. The British hated James Caldwell so much that everywhere he went, he had to go armed to defend his life. Whenever he preached the gospel of peace, he did so with loaded pistols on his pulpit. Let me show you how violently the British hated James Caldwell. A number of British troops were marching by his house, and they saw his wife, Hannah, through a window, holding their baby. Thankfully, there was a neighbor woman in there, but one of the British troops stopped, shot through the window and shot Hannah Caldwell between the eyes, killing her instantly. And thankfully, the neighbor caught the baby as she fell. Later on, of course, James Caldwell himself was murdered by the British. But Caldwell, uh, seeing one of the company's fire slackened for lack of wadding during one of the hottest battles, he jumped on his horse he rode to the nearest Presbyterian meeting house. He got up all those hymnals that were written by Isaac Watts, and he rode back to the battle, and he jumped off the horse and started tearing the wadding out, tearing those papers out, the sheets, and using them for wadding, throwing them to the boys, and said, here you go, boys. Put Watts into them, boys. Give them Watts. Well, here was a man who was a tremendous, tremendous pastor, and yet he was a patriot and he was a leader in the American Revolution. When you come to men like Jonas Clark, everybody is familiar with the shot that was heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington Green, and here our men stood, and there the British are over there, and the British opened fire. And yes, we lose some of our finest on Lexington Green. Most people never understand that their captain and leader was one Jonas Clark. Jonas Clark taught a number of the men how to fire and how to fight. He was the military strategist and leader. Jonas Clark was their pastor. Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg pastored a Protestant Episcopal church in Dunmore, Virginia. He told his people that morning that he was going to preach a, a sermon at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the duties that men owe to God and their country. He took his text that afternoon from the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a time and purpose for every work under heaven. Every sentence that he pronounced burned with patriotic fervor. He was preaching powerfully. The building was packed. Men were standing outside. When he finally finished his sermon, he threw off his black clerical robe and he exclaimed, the time to preach has passed. The time to fight has come. And there he stood in full military uniform. He immediately pointed to a young drummer boy, and the young drummer boy started drumming for recruits, and 300 men volunteered that day and marched off under the leadership of Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. Muhlenberg said later, he said, many will think, ill concerning the decision that he made. 
But he said that he loved his country and liberty was just as dear to him as to anyone else. And then he said, shall I st sit still while the best blood on this continent is spilling? God forbid. He said, if America should fall, should I be saved? No. And then he said, had you ra not rather fight like a man than die like a dog? He said, if I were a bishop, even a Lutheran one, he said, I would consider it my duty to God and to my country. And thus Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg was one of our leading pastors and founding fathers. John Witherspoon was a Presbyterian pastor. He and Roger Sherman were the two men that gave us the hard money clause in our Constitution. These men knew their office of authority. And what has happened in America today? We have a generation of sickly, spineless, backboneless, yellow-bellied pastors who think that God has just called them to be sweet, sickly, sentimental individuals. They don't know the Word of God. They don't know the authority that God has given them, and they're not lifting up their voices as a trumpet and fighting against wickedness and ungodliness and unrighteousness, and we fail to realize that we are spiritual magistrates as well. Why are we so blind? When pastors refuse to preach the totality of the Word of God, the whole counsel of God, then men's blood is upon our hands. I think part of the problem with Christians is pastors have not taught them what the Word of God says about government, what the Word of God says about economics, what the Word of God says about the family. We are totally ignorant ourselves and we're not teaching our people. And the truth is, you can't teach something unless you know it. So that means we have to study. And I'm going to tell you something. It's easier for a pastor to visit and to fellowship than it is to study and dig the truths out of the Word of God. Now, a second problem is this, and that is the individual Christians do not want to study themselves. You know, in Acts chapter 17, the Bible says concerning those Bereans, but these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the Word of God daily as to whether or not these things were so. In other words, every Christian has the responsibility to study to show himself approved unto God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed. In other words, whenever our preachers say something from the pulpit, that Christian needs to take that and take it home to the Word of God and see if what they said is indeed in line with the Word of God. If it is in line with the Word of God, then the Christian needs to obey it. He needs to apply it. If it's not in line with the Word of God, then he needs to put it aside and go back to the pastor and say, you need to explain something to me. How can you say that when the Word of God says this? And then thirdly, unhappily, there are some people who believe that if we ignore situations, they'll just vanish. They'll go away. That is the furthest from the truth. Problems never vanish. They never go away. They have to be resolved in a biblical framework and with biblical solutions. And if you do not resolve them, all problems do is get larger and larger until finally they explode and they cause all kinds of fallout. Part of the problem is the pastors are not teaching. The other part is the Christians are not studying. And most of the time, when they do see truth, they won't apply it. They won't act upon it. And then there is that segment that tries to pretend like everything is all right, and if we ignore our sins, our problems, and our disobediences, that they'll just vanish. That is not so. The proper response of every child of God is found in Luke 6 and verse 46. Jesus Christ said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say unto you? In other words, if I'm your Lord, you obey me. And if you're not obeying me, you better stop calling me Lord. <laughs> you see, the word Lord means boss, owner, master, sovereign. And Jesus said, If I'm your Lord, then you'll obey me. For the real child of God 
The answer is obedience to the truth of God's Word, the totality of that Word. Why have churches incorporated? To be honest with you, they were hoodwinked. There was a mess of porridge put in front of them, and they went for the mess of porridge. You see, if you're incorporated, that means, number one, that no one else can use your church name. Well, what difference does that make? Uh, you know, there are plenty of Bethel Baptist churches, and there are plenty of uh, Christ churches all across this country. It just means in your state, no one can use your name. The second advantage of being incorporated, and I might add the biggest advantage, is what is known as limited liability. Well, that means that you cannot be sued except in terms of the corporation and that no one else outside of that corporation would be responsible or liable for anything over and above the assets of the corporation. Well, you've got to stop and think, who is the head of the church? If Jesus Christ does not protect us, then we are not protected. Listen, folks, the Bible says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. In other words, our protection is of the Lord. The Bible says the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Now, are we going to trust in Jesus Christ, or are we going to trust in the state? Are we going to rest in the limited protection that we have from the state, or are we going to rest in the unlimited protection that we have from Jesus Christ? If something did happen in our local assemblies, Jesus Christ is going to take care of it. You see, if you trust in Jesus Christ, it means it's going to teach you, number one, to be responsible. But here, the state has thrown out this little bowl of porridge, and we say, we'll take it. And then the government says, well, we'll give you tax exemption. Listen, folks, the church of Jesus Christ is not tax exempt. It is tax immune. That is, it is a separate jurisdiction. The state does not have authority over the church of Jesus Christ. It has never had authority over the church of Jesus Christ. And the only way it can get it is if we voluntarily give it to them through either incorporation or these tax exemptions. What has happened to the church's stance? One of the problems that we have today is our churches are really not grounded in the Word of God. In fact, the average church is so interested in success, and when I say success, I mean success in the world's eyes. We want an image. We want fine buildings. We want fine programs. And uh, we want the biggest and we want the best. Well, the interesting thing is what God requires from us is faithfulness. Success in God's eyes is totally different from success in the world's eyes. In fact, uh, Noah, the Bible tells us, was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah preached 120 years and never had one convert. And yet he was put in the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Jeremiah and Isaiah preached and preached and preached, and they certainly never built a big following. In fact, the people that they were preaching to were judged by God and carried away captive, and yet they're in the heroes of faith. Now, the thing that I'm trying to show you is this. Today, many preachers, as well as many Christians, are more interested in an image, and they're more interested in pleasing the world than pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ and obeying Scripture. Now, we have some very serious problems in our land. We have the problem of abortion. We have the problem of sodomy. God speaks directly. God condemns both of these very plainly. We have got to come to the realization that we say God is right. His word is truth. Listen, if a preacher stands up and says that there's nothing wrong with sodomy, you can mark her down. He doesn't know his Bible, or at least he doesn't believe the Bible. What should we do as Christians? 
And it's time that the real, genuine, professing Christian begins to listen to those men who are teaching and believing the Word of God. We cannot follow men who are false shepherds. We cannot follow men who do not even believe the Word of God or believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. We've got to come back and say God is true, His Word is truth, and we're going to obey Him. Now you say, Brother Weaver, if I obey Him, then there are going to be some real consequences in my life. That is true. That is very true. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I had rather face the judgment of man than I had the judgment of God. And I know that my God is able to deliver me. And I had rather obey God than man. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself cautioned people to count the cost. And we've got to count the cost. We may be imprisoned for our faith. We may have our goods and our proper co property confiscated for our faith, but I'd still rather stand for the truth and for the Lord Jesus Christ and suffer now than I had failed to stand and suffer later. So you say, what in the world can I do as a Christian? Voting, writing my congressman, taking things to a court of law, they don't seem to work. What can I do? Let me show you something. One of the most important verses in Scripture is Proverbs 28 and verse 4. The Bible says this, They that forsake the law, that is the law of God, they that forsake the law praise the wicked. When we forsake God's law, we are praising the wicked. But the verse goes on, but whosoever keepeth the law contendeth with the wicked. Now, the word contendeth literally means to fight against. God says if we forsake his law, we praise the wicked. If we keep his law, we fight against the wicked. Do you realize one of the greatest things that you can do to save our country is to be just as godly and as holy and as obedient as you can be. You might not can straighten out a judge, and you might not can straighten out a congressman, but you do have control over your own life. And then when you get your own life in conformity to the Word of God, there's the life of your family. And once you get your family in conformity to the Word of God, there's your occupation. You start and it just kind of mushrooms and goes and goes and goes. You say, Brother Weaver, how in the world is my being holy helping to save our country? Well, two ways. Number one, by your righteous and godly acts, you are condemning all who are unrighteous and ungodly. You're a testimony against them. The Bible says Noah condemned the world. How? By living righteously and godly. And secondly, and most importantly, have you ever stopped to think that as wicked and as ungodly as Sodom and Gomorrah were, God was willing to spare those cities if ten righteous individuals were found? God could have mercy upon us and turn this nation around if people are willing to be obedient and act righteously and godly. Where do we start? We start with individual obedience. And then it goes to family obedience. And then it goes to church obedience. And then it goes to city obedience and county obedience and state obedience until finally it's national obedience. But we will never be an obedient and holy people until we start as individuals. If you would like a copy of Pastor Weaver's book, Christian and Civil Government, please send 1495 check or money order to Smithfields, 8 Sleepy Hollow Lane, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45244. For a VHS copy of this program, as well as the book, send 2995. The Christian and Civil Government is God-honoring and scripturally sound. It is refreshing, 
stimulating, encouraging, and instructional. It is must-reading for those who desire the strong meat of God's Word and seek the truth.